I'm Terrence McNally here at Bioneers 2011, and uh, with me now is Tom Goldtooth. Uh, welcome, Tom. And Tom is the executive director of the Indigenous Environmental Network, IEN. That is a network of over 250 indigenous communities in Canada, U.S., and Mexico. And you can learn more about it at ienearth.org. IENEarth, one word. A social change activist within the Native American community for over 30 years, Tom co-produced an award-winning documentary, Drumbeat for Mother Earth, which addresses the effects of bioaccumulative chemicals on indigenous peoples. He's active with many environmental and social justice organizations beyond IEN. Now, you've been an activist for much of your life. Um, how long has your focus been environmental? Well, actually, it started um, in 1990. Um, there was a lot of things happening during that time. There was uh, private waste industries coming into Indian country. And uh, in addition to that, uh, the nuclear waste industry as well, coming, coming from two different perspectives, toxic waste and radioactive waste. And some people that I know um, in these native communities uh, started to be concerned and wanting to know what could, what could they do as uh, native people from a, from a grassroots level to stop this encroachment of these toxic and radioactive waste companies coming into their territories, talking to their elected tribal leaders. And their concern was that um, some of the tribal leaders were looking at the economic benefits of these proposals that were being pushed by industry and pushed by the government. At the time, I was working as a director of one of the larger tribes in Minnesota, the Red Lake uh, Band of Anishinaabe Ojibwe. And uh, so my, my, my responsibility back then was trying to close up three open burn dumps, mm -hmm. toxic dumps. And um, uh, at, during the early 1990s, uh, you know, we, in, in addition to rural America, you know, there's just lack of funding for a lot of our small governments to be able to, uh, to develop uh, solid waste management programs. And uh, so in Red Lake and Minnesota, you know, the groundwater is uh, sometimes 15, 30 feet down. And if you're just dumping your garbage over there in the back 40, and that's what was happening, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a, a serious potential for contamination of the groundwater. And uh, so they hired me to help uh, develop a solid waste management plan. And I found, I found out that, that there's serious issues concerning uh, environmental justice, okay, and this framework of looking at the inequities of how, you know, our government, uh, the United States, uh, is not recognizing the vulnerability and social, and, and social disparities that are existing. So where, where the dirty plants go, where the waste goes. Yeah, yeah. At that time, you know, in the 90s, in the 80s and early 90s, there was this big uh, not in my backyard movement. So the companies were responding to that and looking for other areas to where they can dump their toxic waste. So they go to communities where they may not have the political power to stop right. the big corporations and they approach either governmental leaders or county leaders, parish leaders in, in the South, or tribal leaders with these promises. We got the money, you got the land, let us use your resources, we got safe technology to dump our toxic waste in your land. And, uh, and during that time, um, um, we found uh, that, uh, that there's disparities, like I mentioned, and there's a report by the United uh, uh, Church of Christ mm -hmm. on the disparities, and that the, indeed environmental racism does exist in this country on which communities get dumped on first and which communities get cleaned up first. Last or, or first. Yeah. And this is kind of the birth of the environmental justice movement? It is, it is. It, uh, definitely there is clear evidence that there's disparities, that environmental racism uh, does exist and that we need to organize as people of color communities and native communities. We came together from a, you know, from a different mindset as native people, members of uh, American Indian tribes and Alaska natives, 
uh, because we have treaty rights. That's right. Okay? So how do we organize and come together with the people of color around a civil rights movement uh, and coming together, uh, lifting up our treaty rights and stand together? So uh, we were able to, to work together, and some people call this the new civil rights movement. You know, um, But um, this is how we started to address issues involving corporations, mining companies, um, contaminated sites, uh, especially like in Alaska, with the defense uh, department, uh, with all these uh, formerly uh, uh, military bases up there that left behind, you know, toxic uh, contamination from these barrels and radioact radioactive experiments. And We've got a lot of that. In, I live in Los Angeles. We've got oh, a lot yeah. Because there was oh, a big yeah. aerospace in the 50s yeah. there. Um, when did you start, I, if you started, when did you start IEN, uh, the Indigenous Environmental Network? And 250 indigenous communities, that's a big organization. It's a big organization. Um, I was brought in uh, late um, 1990, 91, um, and I'm not the founder, uh, but I was recruited. Uh -huh. And there's a good story to that, in fact. Go ahead. Uh, um, I, I, took, I took employment with the Red Lake uh, uh, tribe up in Minnesota as their environmental coordinator. And uh, I saw a lot of the, the problems that we're having in Indian country, where the federal government has a trust responsibility, okay, uh, to protect the health and to protect our, our lands. And um, they have a fiduciary responsibility based upon agreements that we made as the first peoples, mm -hmm. the first inhabitants of this land. So uh, we negotiated agreements at the highest level of international law treaties. Okay? And so in exchange for land, we reserve certain rights for ourselves, including uh, uh, developing a trust relationship where the federal government has a responsibility okay, to take care and protect our territories, our lands. Our reserves are called reservations. So whether it's uh, education, whether it's uh, law enforcement, uh, health, uh, and environment, they have a responsibility. So as these reports started to come out that there's disparities yeah. and that there's disproportionate impact to indigenous peoples related to uh, health exposure, I mean, uh, related to toxic exposure, that impacts the human health of our population, sure, sure. or whether it's environment and the way that industrial development, our econo the economic development has been uh, developed within our communities. We found that literally uh, uh, there's uh, toxic uh, liquids percolating out of the ground. Are there contaminated sites from uranium mining in the Southwest? Are there formerly used defense facilities called FUDs in Alaska? Um, and where our people were being affected. And especially when we take, a, take into consideration uh, cultural impacts, to where part of the culture and a lot of our population have a close relationship to land where we still eat fish. Ah, okay. so you're more vulnerable. We're more vulnerable. Because you live closer to the land. So yeah, and we, the consume, land. we consume that fish that has yeah. high concentrations sure. of mercury contamination are our dioxin contamination, persistent organic pollutants yeah. that biomagnify, okay, in, in our food system. For someone who doesn't system. know what biomagnify and bioaccumulate means. Yeah. Basically, we have a situation in this country and other parts of the world where certain chemicals go into the body of, 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 of fish, for an example, and, and collect in the fatty tissue area, okay? And it, it magnifies. It doesn't. It doesn't break down. Okay. Uh, so, and, so and as you go up the, up the, the food, food chain, chain exactly. you go up the food chain. That. Okay. That's where it starts to accumulate. Yeah. And then we, as humans, and as native people, start eating that. Yeah. So we get high concentrations of this. Uh, in the eastern Great Lakes area with a lot of our uh, Six Nations and John Mohawk was one of the uh, board members of Bioneers. Right. Uh, comes from a certain area along the St. River uh, 
the St. Lawrence uh, River uh, area, and uh, there's a lot of contamination there from the from the, some of the um, automotive uh, industry and uh, uh, aluminum factories and PCB contamination from power, uh, from power plants, but not just power plants, when some of the processing oh. in the process of aluminum. Uh, so it completely contaminated a certain area to where there was PCB contamination in the breast milk of sure. our women. Yeah. So it, it, really, it really hit our community pretty hard because we already are experiencing the, the, the social trauma uh, of residential schools, uh, alcoholism, a lot of the other symptoms of colonization. And now we're finding that there's toxic c contamination in our bodies that can be contributing uh, to, the, to the well-being of our people. Right. And how do you introduce that? You know, how do you introduce that to people already uh, experiencing high suicide rates to even say, you're telling me my body... Things are worse than you thought. My, yeah, yeah, my body is full of toxics. Uh, so, so we took this really serious as a health, you know, as a health issue and, um, and uh, started developing popular education. And we have an award-winning film that we produced with, uh, uh, with USA Greenpeace. We, that's where we started to develop partnerships mm. with non-native organization environmental uh, groups because we can't do this alone as indigenous peoples. And uh, we, need, uh, we need American people. We need people to... Uh, to uh, uh, learn about these things and to take action in support of the First Peoples. One thing you said to me be before we started the interviews, when I asked like what activities you were involved in today, you said whatever it is, and we'll talk a little bit about the uh, tar sands pipeline, but you said that underneath whatever the issue of the day is, is really something about changing consciousness. Uh, yes, definitely. Um, and, and that's what makes this work exciting. Oh, good. Um, you know, in addition to, you know, the, the, these hardcore issues that we're dealing with, and, and like I said, it's a life and death issue, um, is that uh, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, okay? And, uh, and that light at the end of the tunnel are, are the prophecies that many of our tribal people have. And those prophecies are, are talking about change and transition. And, and definitely there's, there's different paths that, you know, that humanity, that people can take. Uh, and, and sometimes we translate that into man that walks uh, two legs, you know, the two-legged people. Uh, that they're going to get themselves in a situation to where uh, man has to make some critical decisions to either take this road here or take the high road, to take the high road, is, is actually uh, where we're at right now. So in other words, when you're talking about consciousness raising, it sounds like to some extent you're saying, go back to what you used to know. Go back to the stories you used to tell. What I've been uh, telling people is, uh, all people, including many, many of our, our people and our many different uh, tribes, our indigenous peoples, is that, is that we have to reevaluate what our relationship is to the sacredness of Mother Earth. It ha we have to be, be able to do some deep thinking about how we live and how we walk on Mother Earth and what does Mother Earth mean to us, to you, to our families, to American people, people of industrialized country, people of developing countries. And, uh, and it, it does demand some, uh, some change, a new paradigm. And that's why we've been embracing uh, this concept of rights of Mother Earth, rights of nature, so that Mother Earth has standing. Now, uh, for those of you who don't know, the, there's a movement in the U.S., but, but one of the signature achievements is that the country of Ecuador, when they redid their constitution, enshrined the rights of nature as a constitutional right. Bolivia followed suit, and now there is a, an international movement. Um, before the native peoples were negotiating with the U.S. government and so on, were the rights of nature in your own I remember uh, when we were talking about this uh, concept of rights to Mother Earth, uh, 
a couple of years ago, and um, we had um, uh, talked to some uh, folks from, from Ecuador. We had talked to some people from uh, down in South America uh, about this concept. It, 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 it took me back when I was younger in the 70s. I used to uh, keep track of our native leaders that were going to Geneva to the Human Rights uh, uh, Council and, uh, of the United Nations. And I remember some of the, the testimonies, the interventions that our elders made, like Thomas Bayaka, Leon Shenandoah from the Six Nations. And these were uh, spiritual, these were uh, indigenous leaders of our different tribes that went to Geneva to lift up the human rights issue of our people. And I remember uh, some of those interventions that they said uh, to world leaders is that they are here to speak for those that cannot speak for themselves. They're here to speak for the birds, the plant nation, the animal nation, and that's what they were saying. So we have this consciousness yeah. as indigenous people of our relationship to the sacredness, which is also the female creative principle of Mother Earth. So that's very important as men as well to understand our place in this cosmos, our place. That's my phone. Oh, what should we do? Why don't you just keep it rolling, but grab the phone. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's off now. Technology. Mm. I use technology in the work that I do. Yep. Yeah. yeah. We've been telling everybody to shut them off. We just forgot. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think the last thing you, you you had just said they were doing this at Geneva, and so you were saying this idea of rights of nature goes yeah. back. For well, that that's part of uh, you know that's part of what we see that's coming about as far as the transition. And part of the transition is also seeing the dominant society, the descendants of the settlers, the immigrants who have come here, uh, to be able to see that the lifestyles that uh, they are living, that we're all living now, is not sustainable. Right. It also really is demanding us to rethink you know, the economic system that we live in. We need a new economic paradigm that, doesn't, that uh, respects uh, Mother Earth that respects nature, that doesn't look at uh, natural resources in a way of exploitation, right. Right. short term, unlimited yeah. growth. Yeah. So what does that mean for us as uh, common people, whether it's uh, here in California or whether it's in Minnesota, New York City, urban and rural? Uh, what does that really mean to us? But it does require us again to rethink what our relationship is to the sacredness of Mother Earth. Yeah. And it really goes a lot deeper than the concept of stewardship, which is still a form of ownership or dominion, okay? So, but we have to take steps. Indigenous people have a relationship of reciprocity to Mother Earth. Uh, when we say on, the, on our, our, our different languages, uh, my mom is Navajo, Dene. And then uh, also on the other side of my culture is Dakota. When we say mitakiawasi, that means all my relations. And the concept of being related to all of life, animate and inanimate, that, that I am one of life itself, not above, not under, but at the same level, you know. Yeah. And to lower ourselves when we go into our ceremonies, walking or crawling on our knees, bowing down in a humble way as part of, uh, of life itself. That consciousness and that humility of humanity, okay, is very important. And the governments that make decisions and how we work with the private sector, the corporations, Everything is right now in flux, okay? And, uh, and our prayer, our ceremonies, is that uh, there will be clarity, you know, uh, as far as what do we make of this right now? 
as people. We bring people together and now we're starting to look at green technologies. We're starting to look at green chemistry. We're starting to look at green engineering. What is green economy? Green jobs. You know, is it going to still be part of a structure of exploitation? Or were, or were the people that are living out in society are still demanding participation? What is it, how does it reflect what's called grassroots democracy? Okay, we're seeing that now. With the Occupy That's right. Wall Street, yeah. Occupy. And it's growing. Yes, it so is. So we're seeing these different movements that are emerging. You know, we got the movement of people looking at biology and importance of life itself, you know, and, and people embracing technology and what is appropriate technology to address the issues that we're facing now of a sustainable community. Uh, and I believe that as indigenous peoples, we have a certain indigenous consciousness, indigenous knowledge that is very important to utilize in seeking solutions throughout the world. In other words, you're saying, I think, that in your consciousness, in your cultures, the appropriate relationship within nature is, it goes back, and for many immigrants, it would be a new idea. But for, for well, you, it's, it's also, the old idea. Yes, it's an old idea, and we, we can bring that, we can bring that out. And, uh, but also, my generation are part of the modern generation as well. You know, I'm already past that half century mark. Yeah. And we have children now coming up, kind of like that seventh generation. Now they are taking it a lot deeper, okay? My generation had to challenge a lot of, uh, of, of, lot of the policies uh, of this country. You know, I come from a resistance consciousness right. for, my, for my generation. You know, it we was, it was a we civil questioned. rights struggle. Of and it was a, a red movement struggle, yeah. you know? And, and you're it saying in the, in, the, in the generation coming now, it's a different consciousness. Well, it's a dis different consciousness as well as, as far as taking a deeper analysis of how we apply and, and put into action the, the, the work that my generation has done, that has a foundation of the original instructions. That's very important, the original instructions of our respective indigenous nations, the original instructions that are part of our genesis of who we are. As, as, as indigenous people. And that embraces our indigenous traditional knowledge and language. And that's why we have uh, indigenous uh, nations that are, are, are uh, lifting up the importance of language revitalization. Uh, because, you know, it, it, it is a form of, uh, of, of warfare that some of our indigenous people said, we are in a state of war because our languages have been attacked. And now as a response, we're going to revitalize our language at every level that we can do. We cannot lose our language. Uh, and um, it is looking back at all the symptoms of colonization as well. You know, one of those symptoms of colonization that we are embracing and creating language for is internalized oppression. Sure. Okay. And uh, so, so part of the work that we involved ourselves in as Indigenous Environmental Network is to, is to have popular education around decolonization. Building sustainable communities is lifting up our traditions, our language, and looking at it from an Indigenous mindset, okay? And, um, and so part of this uh, initiative, too, is very important, you know, is to to challenge the introduction of new technologies, you know, like in climate change, for mm -hmm. example. Uh, if we are to brace different technologies, you know, we have to really study that. What are the protocols for introduction of technologies to save this planet? What are the consequences? The consequences, I and mean, what are the protocols? Mm -hmm. Are there safety protocols for these? Mm -hmm. Similar to an introduction of genetically modified right. organisms. Right there's still lack of safety protocols in that. Um, but I think, you know, uh, you know, 
the settlers, the European people who have immigrated here, built colonies, United States, uh, Canada, um, all come from, from an Earth-based culture as well, sometimes in that... In the past. In the past, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so when we had early settlers come into Minnesota, they say that they used to plant their seeds at certain times of the, of, of the month, wherever the moon's position was, or when they put posts in the ground. Uh, there are certain times of the month they would do that. So there was still some of that old world yeah. consciousness of the relationship to Mother Earth. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I would ask one last question. This will be the last one, which is, what are some of the things that give you hope right now? Um, the younger generation are, are, are looking for, for solutions uh, of, of how to make a better world possible. Uh, we've been looking at uh, the social movements, the popular movements especially from the global south and 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 bringing that uh, consciousness for change and transition as society looking at all the different uh, uh, mechanisms of society whether it's economics politics environment uh, self-development community development um, and we we've been organizing as uh, indigenous people within our network forming uh, a common ground of understanding with uh, the settlers, with the white people, with the black people, with the brown people, with the yellow people, and trying to come together, you know. And uh, we just uh, finished uh, our second uh, U.S. social forum in Detroit. Um, and our first one was in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and, and uh, getting involved with these participatory, you know, people's assemblies to really ask some of these deep questions as community, building community. Part of our indigenous involvement in this is actually to help, you know, frame some of this, especially from a, a relationship to Mother Earth level, is building community and bringing community closer to nature. Because if we, if we look back at history, there was a process of industrialization that removed people from nature. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, so that you know, there's, there's there's deeper, definitely, you know, there's deeper understanding of this, and I'm I'm talking about generalities, you know, but that's what gives me hope that the prophecies that there be a time when these people would be looking for solutions and answers. And uh, I remember one of the uh, films that I saw uh, of the Kogi in Colombia. The Kogi were talking about what happened to them in Colombia at the Inquisition, at the, at the time the Spanish people came. Uh, and they, they lost all their, their, they lost everything during those uh, years. Uh, and the Kogi, year, now years and years, years later, uh, our concern, so they sent a message to the world, a message of the older brother to the younger brother. They saw uh, the changes in the high elevations of their mountain area, and uh, they're worried about what's happening. So they sent a message that uh, people of the world, world leaders need to change how they're living. And uh, so when they sent that message out, it was in the 1990s, the Kogi people. And I remember watching that, and, and, and uh, in recent years, we had that big gathering where 35,000 people came to Cochabamba, Bolivia. Yes. Okay. And these were people, uh, uh, farmers, small farmers, indigenous people, women, students, uh, uh, workers, uh, people from the north and people from the south, and, and really working hard at trying to find some commonality but finding solutions, breaking up into these little clusters called work, working groups and uh, actually going through some debates and, uh, and came, came out with uh, some, some declarations. One of them was the Cochabamba Accord related to climate 
and the other was the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth. That's what gave me hope and said, it's true what our indigenous people were saying. We only have one Mother Earth, and we need to do everything we can to respect the sacredness of our Mother Earth and to understand the concepts of our relationship to protect for the future generation. You know? yeah. And that means that uh, we have to be able to have a mechanisms for making decisions you know, as, as, as societies and the governments that we put into office to ma help make decisions for us. And uh, that's why we have always embraced the seventh generation principle. That's also known as the precautionary principle. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank okay. you very much, Tom. Yes.